Okay, I'm going to start this Module 9 recording of Cancer and the Dying Child. This you'll find in your textbook, Chapters 33 and 34. There's a very beautiful picture there of a little girl with her um, head wrap on and her teddy bear. She's really bright and beautiful and smiling. So this just um, kind of elicits for you that they don't look a whole lot different than normal children other than obviously they're probably going to be a little more frail. They may be a little more pale in the face. Uh, maybe they may have a few more obvious signs of illness, but we need to treat them just like we would any other kid with a few exceptions and that's what we're going to be talking about during this recording. Okay, so I'm just going to give a very brief overview. If you want to read it in your textbook, it gives a much more thorough, in-depth uh, discussion of it. But basically, cancer is an out-of-control growth of, of abnormal cells. They no longer have the, um, the growth inhibitor. They don't listen to those signals anymore, and it's very abnormal. The technical term for that is called anaplasia. If you go back to anatomy and physiology, or if you've had any pathophysiology, anaplasia is what we call the spread and the proliferation of cancer cells. Tumors can be of two types. One is benign, which has a slow, limited, non-invasive growth. It's not cancerous. It's self-limited. It, it doesn't spread. Then there's malignant, which is progressive, virulent growth. This is what's considered cancerous. And this is uh, these types of cells can metastasize and infect other parts of the body from where they start. OK, so a few cancer terms for you to be familiar with. Remission, the partial or complete disappearance of signs and symptoms of the disease. Extravasation, which is leakage of potentially damaging medications into tissue. So if you have an IV that infiltrates, the medications that you are giving, the chemotherapy medications, are um, vesicants. So they could actually destroy the tissues. Induction is chemotherapy that is given to achieve remission. So in some cases, it can be very aggressive. Consolidation is chemotherapy given after induction to control microscopic disease. Maintenance, which would be chemotherapy that is given on a long-term basis to maintain the remission. So even after the client is in remission, we're continuing with the chemotherapy to maintain that remission. And then palliative care, this is treatment that is given to relieve the side effects of the chemotherapy or the radiation. It's not aimed toward curing the problem. It's mainly to help the client live a more productive life, meeting them where they're at and trying to help them be as functional as possible. So this slide here goes through some of the most common ca childhood cancers. Leukemias are the most common type at 31%, and the most common of that type is acute lymphocytic leukemia. Then you have brain and central nervous system cancers, which are 25%. The 16% or other are your solid uh, tumors, like brain tumors. And then you have neuroblastoma, which is also a type of brain tumor. Wilms, which is 5%. The Hodgkin's lymphomas and the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, those each make up uh, 4%. Rhabdomyosarcoma, which is 3%. Osteosarcoma, which is 3%. Retinoblastoma, which affects the eyes, that's 2%. And the Ewing sarcoma, which is 1%. So some of your signs and symptoms, um, fever, fatigue, Lethargy, anemia, that's very classic, being kind of pale in color, loss of appetite, bone or joint pain, depending on what type of cancer it is, um, decreased RBCs and platelets that could lead to bleeding. Remember, if it affects the bones, it's going to affect your blood cells. 
Okay, so some very generic nursing care. We'll go into more specific nursing care as we progress, but right now we're just going to go with some generalities. So obviously administering the chemotherapy that is prescribed, maintaining the nutrition of the client, preventing infection, because remember when they're getting these treatments, their immune system is going to be affected. Control pain, cancer is very painful. Provide psychosocial support to not only the client, but to the family manage negative and long-term effects of cancer treatment, things like radiation effects and chemotherapy side effects, understand the use of surgery, and understand um, psychological impact of pediatric cancer. It not only affects the family, but it can also affect the nurse that is caring for them. Because after all, this is a child, and children are not supposed to have diseases like this. So it can be very emotionally impactful for the nurse that's taking care of them. Okay, so we'll start off with nutrition. It's very important to maintain a good nutrition for a cancer patient. Uh, it's important for healing for your um, tissues to regenerate. We have to have a good nutritional status. So we are gonna be educating the parents about proper nutrition. We're going to be looking into the side effects of chemotherapy because remember side effects number one is nausea and vomiting. Maintain the immune system. So we're gonna be wanting to prevent infection. So maybe not having things like fresh fruits and vegetables, but having things that are cooked to decrease the risk of a foodborne illness. Uh, try simple care measures first. Um, enteral feedings or TPN may be the only option eventually, but we need to try least invasive before we move to most invasive, and TPN and enteral feedings would be considered most invasive. Communicate to parents that their child may be able to eat independently again. We just have to get their strength up a little bit. But, you know, this isn't the end of the road. We want to try to keep them as positive as we possibly can. So infection is a very real risk for any cancer patient or anyone who is undergoing cancer treatment because their immune system is going to be affected. So part of the nursing care for preventing infection is to monitor for systemic and localized signs of infection every two to four hours. So you're frequently monitoring them. You're monitoring their temperature. Report any temperature that is greater than 101.2 in a 24 hour period or 100.4 three times in a 24 hour period. So 100.4 technically is not considered a temperature. It has to be above 101 before we technically consider it a temperature. But if you're getting this reading more than three times or at least three times, then to me that would be a concern. Provide meticulous skin care, use good hand washing, make sure that you're educating visitors, educating the family about maintaining good hand washing, educate the client, gotta make sure that you're keeping your hands clean. Do not cohort patients who have an infection or at risk of infection. So if you're the charge nurse working on the pediatric floor and a patient like this were to come in, you're gonna want them to be in a private room. You are not gonna to wanna to house them with anybody that you think could potentially be at risk for infection. Use standard precautions and any designated isolation precautions that are necessary. In some cases, uh, back in my day, we used to call it reverse isolation. Now I believe they call it neutropenic precautions. So basically, with those types of precautions, you're protecting the client from you. You are wearing the PPE, the mask, the gloves, the gown, all that garb. You're wearing that to protect the client from you. Their immune system is so down that they can't possibly fight off anything. So you don't necessarily have to have obvious signs of infection. You are still going to be providing them with this type of protection because they could become sick from just anything at all. Monitor and report lab values is going to be very important to watch those trends, those cues. Teach family about the principles of prophylactic antibiotics and signs and symptoms of infection. You're going to want to make sure that the family is aware of what's going on because when you're not in the room, they are, or hopefully they will be. So you're going to want to make sure that they are aware when things start happening. 
Chemotherapy is usually done in combination. It's not just one type of medication that's being given. It's usually a combination of medications. But you have to have training. There is special training that nurses who provide chemotherapy have to go through. It's not something that a generalist bedside pediatric nurse would be able to provide. You need to handle the medications and wastes per guidelines. There's special gloves that have to be used. There's special waste containers that have to be used. If you look uh, at table 33-2 on page 1371 through 1373, that does give you uh, a discussion on these different types of chemotherapeutic agents. Some of the more common ones that you have probably heard of before, um, cytoxin, that's a, a pretty common one that you probably have heard of before. Adriamycin, that's another one that you've probably heard of before. Epigen or Procrit, when you're at the hospital and you're working on the floors and you're providing care for different clients, sometimes your client may be on some of these medications like Epigen that is supposed to boost their um, red blood cells, it's supposed to stimulate the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. They also have Nupigen, which is basically the same type of medication, but it's meant for the white blood cells. Okay, and then you also have uh, the drugs that they give for the side effects, and specifically the one that you probably are most familiar with would be Zofran. That's the antiemetic that is given for, for your um, chemotherapy side effects to prevent the nausea and vomiting. Okay, so this slide kind of goes through some of those chemo side effects, nausea and vomiting, as I said. Uh, alopecia, which is the hair loss, it can also um, happen like not just the top of the head, which is most obvious, but sometimes they can lose their eyebrows, they can lose their eyelashes, they can lose some skin hair. I mean, they can lose their hair. So for a young person, this would be very devastating to their body image. Extravasation, which, as I said, can cause tissue damage if you have medications that you're giving intravenously and it starts to leak into the tissues. Mucositis, which is, uh, affects the mouth. It can cause a lot of pain to the mouth, so that can affect whether or not they eat. Diarrhea. So obviously we can have the uh, risk of skin breakdown because of diarrhea. We also worry about dehydration. Constipation, which is the other way where they end up getting bound up and they're not able to have a bowel movement. This could lead to potential uh, bowel obstructions. Anemia, as I said earlier, where they have a low red blood cell count, so they become very anemic. Their H&H &H can be affected. They may require blood transfusions. A lot of times with cancer patients specifically, you do end up doing a lot of blood transfusions and a child with uh, cancer is not going to be any different because the medications that they give do cause anemia. So it's not unusual for these children to require blood transfusions. Thrombocytopenia where their platelets are affected so now we have to worry about bleeding. And then of course neutropenia where they are at high risk for infection, so we have to assess them for fever, we have to maybe do blood cultures to make sure they don't have something inside that could cause them to go septic, and then administering antibiotics, and a lot of times the antibiotics are prophylactic to prevent a potential infection. Okay, as far as radiation is concerned, some of the measures that we use, uh, we have to, obviously, nausea. That can also happen with radiation, alopecia, which is the hair loss, fatigue and malaise, just kind of feeling run down, low white blood cell count, a skin desquamation. So it can cause actual tissue damage. The radiation can. They try... It's very localized. It's very, very centered on where they need to go to have this done. They, they work very hard at preventing the radiation from hitting anywhere it's not supposed to. But where it's hitting could cause tissue damage, so that's definitely something we need to be aware of. And mucus, mucus membrane inflammation or irritation. Those are all potential side effects of radiation. Sometimes they do surgery as an adjunct when they are receiving chemotherapy and radiation. They'll go in and actually take the tissues out to prevent potential spread of the problem. It's not 100% that they're absolutely going to do surgery, but it is an option if they feel that that is going to help 
okay it's a very invasive type of treatment to be sure but if it's going to prevent the spread of the disease and maybe help the child live longer then obviously that is something that we are going to advocate for important role in the diagnosis of tumor via biopsy so getting that tissue out and being able to take a look at it under the microscope is going to be very important and in this case insertion of central venous catheters a lot of times they have to do that in surgery depending on the type of catheter that they're putting in if they're putting in a what we call a groshon catheter that would definitely have to be done in surgery they could not do that in x-ray okay now pain management absolute favorite I am a very strong advocate for pain management especially for children because I think a lot of times pain gets overlooked in the pediatric population so we want to make sure that we are administering those pain medications combined with adequate rest and sleep maybe providing them a little bit of massage heat distraction keeping the TV on maybe playing music for them playing games with them keep them entertained and then also providing that social support okay use topical anesthetics things like emla emla cream it's uh, kinda like what they use in the dentist office it's a type of lidocaine okay uh, like they use novocaine in the dentist office they use emla cream in the hospitals to to numb up the sites before they do any type of painful procedures like IV sticks or maybe blood draws. Remember, these kids are getting poked a lot and it's very, very painful. It makes them very nervous and very uncomfortable. So we want to try to provide as much comfort measures as we possibly can. And don't forget their culture. Remember, we cannot separate culture from who they are. And even in the pediatric population, we need to still make sure that we are integrating their culture into all the care that we provide. Okay, so psychological support, providing holistic nursing care, encouraging the family to stay, rooming in. Involve the child life specialist. So your child life specialist is very good in these types of situations because they use play therapy to kind of help the child begin to understand and deal with what's going on with them. Another part is being present, just being there, just being supportive in the fact that you are listening to what they're telling you you're listening to the client you're listening to their family you're just basically being a sounding board provide the family with any resources connect them with others that are going through the same thing that they are support groups online communities there's lots of those out there and it'd be important for them to get linked to those so they realize they really are not alone there are others out there that are going through the same thing that they are. Okay, so just real quickly, some cancer-related medical emergencies, hemorrhagic cystitis, which affects the bladder, it causes blood in the urine, septic shock, so that's overwhelming sepsis, causes the child to go into shock, and the children can die from this. Uh, nursing care, obviously fast identification of the, of the problem, because it is an emergency, so it requires fast action. Obviously, maintaining the hydration and your ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. We cannot forget that. Obviously, this is going to require, if they're on the floor, a rapid response. Okay, so now we're going to move on to care of the dying child. So working with the dying child places an emotional strain on the nurse. Remember, nurses are human beings. We are human beings. And we feel what everybody feels. It's very devastating to take care of a child who's dying because again children are not supposed to die they're not supposed to have these devastating illnesses we don't expect that so when we are when we are taking care of them it really puts an emotional strain on us attachment to family while you're working so closely with them it's a very difficult time in their lives and you do get very attached to the family it's devastating for you you feel like a member of your family has died and children they will adapt to their situation much easier than adults do they learn to cope they they may not understand 100% when you're dealing with a really young child they're not really probably going to get it 100% but they definitely do adapt to it much better than the adults in their lives do okay so this slide goes over the impact of a chronic condition so 
creates a threat of the unknown, the child is going to lose control and have long-term effects from this condition. Chronic, meaning it's going on for a long period of time. Causes frequent hospitalizations or clinic visits. So the kiddo is spending a large proportion of their life in the hospital or in a hospital type environment. Disrupts normal home routines. Kids like routines. Even though they might fight and argue and, and carry on, they need those routines. It's very important to them. When they go into an environment where their routines have been disruptive, it's very upsetting for them. Places more demand on the caregiver. So now the person who is the main caregiver, and there's usually one, sometimes, you know, it is divided up pretty evenly, but in most cases, in most families, you have one parent who is the main caregiver. And this is going to put a lot more stress and strain on them. May cause parents to become controlling and overprotective because they know that their kiddo is in a very tenuous position. So they're going to become those tiger parents. They're going to be helicopter parents just circling and circling and circling and watching everything that you do. Causes the child to have to cope with unfamiliar people, places, and medical treatments. They're thrust in this world of strangers, people that they do not know, and it's very scary. May cause family to be overwhelmed and experience social financial and psychological strain. Remember, if you have two working parents and you have a kiddo with this type of problem and they have to be hospitalized a lot or they have to go to a lot of doctor's appointments and clinic visits, it's going to cause financial issues and, you know, the person who is experiencing this, they may end up losing their job or they may have to take FMLA to be able to take their child and be available to their child. And this can cause a lot of financial stress on the family. Not to mention the fact, if there are siblings involved, if this has more than just the sick child, if there are other children involved, there could be some issues with them because now this sick child has become the center of everybody's world and everything that they do and everywhere that they go revolves around this child. And sometimes, even though it, it's unintentional, it's, it's normal human behavior, they might become a little bit resentful of this child because now everything revolves around them and they basically are being ignored because of this really sick child. Okay, so now these next few slides, we're going to go through the different age groups for the child. Uh, a chronic condition can have differing effects on the child depending on their age. Okay, that should make sense. The nursing care will always center on the family as a whole. We do family-centered care when we're taking care of pediatric patients, and that is no different for the chronic conditions, cancer patients, or dying child. Providing support by being present and non-judgmental. And there is no right way to grieve a loss. Okay, a lot of times we can be a little bit judgmental that, you know, they, they just don't seem to be really sad. They're not crying very much. They seem very out of it. Or they're not really reacting the way I expect them to. Well, there is really no right way to act. This is a very devastating occurrence. And maybe that is their way of protecting themselves from having to accept the fact that their child has this tremendous disease that is eventually probably going to kill them. And, and that, I mean, if you put yourself in their place, I think it would be very difficult and I don't think that we have the right to to say whether or not they're grieving correctly or not because there is no right way to grieve. We have to meet them where they're at, wherever they are in the grief process. That's where we meet them and we just have to provide as much support as we possibly can. Okay, so for your infant, it's going to alter the bonding process. It's going to make it very difficult to achieve that bonding process. They have pain. Infants feel pain the same as adults. Any type of procedure that has been done that causes pain in an adult will cause pain in the infant. Any type of disease process that causes pain in the adult, conversely, is going to cause pain in the infant. Changes in the diet and sleep may alter their growth and development. Remember, sleep is very, very important. It helps us to grow. It helps us to heal. 
So any alterations in that are, are going to affect that. So some of the nursing care that we can provide for the infant, we can rock them, hold them, comfort them, use a very soothing voice when you're talking to them, provide visual and auditory stimulation with little mobiles and you know lights and sound. Uh, group nursing care measures. So you want to cluster your care. You want to make sure that you get everything done at one time and then try to encourage that rest and that sleep. Maintain the crib as a safe place. We don't perform any painful procedures inside the child's room. Encourage parents to hold the infant and encourage siblings to visit. You know, make sure that the siblings are involved too. That's going to help to prevent some of that resentment that they may feel. Okay, so for the a toddler, you know, they're trying to be autonomous. That's where we're trying to do potty training. They're, you know, I'm going to be a big boy or a big girl. I can go potty by myself. This may affect that. They, they may not be able to accomplish that. They're going to have pain. They have anxiety. They feel, you know, nervous because they're separated from their parents. Um, they may be really sensitive to bodily harm. Uh, their gross and fine motor development obviously is going to be affected. They are stressed and they're going to regress. It's very, very obvious that they will regress. They're, you know, they're not going to, if they have been potty trained, they're going to end up going back and they're going to be bedwetting and, you know, they're going to be incontinent. And this is something that we have to anticipate and provide that anticipatory guidance to the family. So we want to maintain the bond between the parents and the child, promote realistic developmental skills. Again, we got to meet them where they're at. Do not react negatively to the regression, and we want to make sure, again, that anticipatory guidance, we want to make sure we're educating the parents, you know, this is probably going to happen, but we can't make them feel bad about it. Praise the child for attempts at self-care. Instruct parents on realistic methods of discipline, you know, they're still toddlers, and they may actually have more outbursts or more temper tantrums related to what's happening to them. Remember, their, their routines have been messed with and they don't like that. Uh, manage pain, maintain home routine as much as humanly possible. We try to maintain those routines as much as we possibly can and allow the child to express their feelings through play. That is one of the things that play does. It allows the child a way to express how they feel. So we want to encourage that. Now the preschooler has very magical thinking, so they feel like they are being punished because they did something wrong. They may act regressively, or aggressively, excuse me, they, they might be more, might have more outbursts than what you normally would see. They also can regress. Uh, withdraw from others. Maybe they're just going to kind of be more quiet than they normally are, not as social as they usually would have been, and obviously may have some difficulty sleeping because they fear if they go to sleep, they may not wake up. Again, that's the magical thinking happening. So for us, we want to provide the opportunity to do express their fears and frustrations. Again, remember play is very good at allowing the child to express their fears, express their feelings, uh, maybe telling them stories or reading books with them. Use dramatic play, again, to get all those feelings out. Um, ask the child life spe specialist for assistance. Again, this is their thing. This is, this is what they do. So they're very good at providing this type of support. Maintain the normal home schedule, just like we did with the toddler. Enforce consistent limits. Reassure the child that nothing that they did caused this problem. Because again, with that magical thinking, you have to reassure them that no, they didn't do anything wrong. Okay, that's not why this is happening. Be honest. Remember, we always have to be honest. Once we've lied, they're never going to trust us again. So we want to be honest when we're explaining and preparing them for procedures. May, we want to make sure that we're making it age appropriate. Whatever explanations we're providing, they need to be age appropriate and understand their limited concept of time. Preschoolers don't understand time. They understand different things that happen during the day. So if you talk to them, you want to talk about something that's going to happen in the morning, then you talk to them in relation to breakfast time. Or if you want to talk to them about something that may happen in the evening, again, you want to talk to them in relation to dinner time. 
That they understand, but if you're going to tell them 6 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, they don't understand that. They cannot tell time yet when they're preschoolers. Okay, so as they age and they get into school, they start to understand the concept of their disease process more. Okay, uh, they alter their autonomy and their peer relationships. Remember, as they're getting up towards that adolescent stage, the peers become more important to them. It's a very important part of who they are. Interrupts their independence. They might refuse to comply with treatments or comply with any special diets. Again, they're, they're trying to be autonomous. They're trying to assert their autonomy, and this is one way that they can do it. They're not going to go along with what you want them to do. Cannot completely comprehend all of the information. They might be reluctant to provide answers to whatever questions you're asking them. They may understand the significance of the illness and lifelong consequences. So as they're getting closer, when they get to be tweenies, that 10 to 12 stage, they start to understand illness. They start to understand the impact of their disease and what's happening around them. They do start to understand that more. So what we want to do, obviously, is we want to keep up on that pain. We want to make sure that we're doing very frequent pain assessments. Reassure that their personal behavior has not caused the illness. You know, they're not the reason that they have this illness. Answer any questions at the level they understand. So again, age appropriate. Use play as an outlet. Okay, just whatever, you know, again, play is good for them to express their feelings. Include their peers as much as you possibly can. Remember, we, we're concerned about infection, so we can't have the whole classroom come in and visit them. But maybe, you know, you could do um, FaceTime on, on their phones or something like that, you know, and maybe have it during class time where all of their peers are there and everybody can see, you know, hi, how are you? We hope you feel better, that kind of thing. Communicate to family about nonverbal cues. Keep your eye out. You know, sometimes the nonverbal cues, remember, they speak louder than words do. 90% of our communication is nonverbal. Maintain an open and honest dialogue with the kiddo. You know, you always want to make sure that you're being honest with them. The minute you do, if they catch you in a lie, they're never going to trust you again, no matter what you do. And now we've come to our adolescent. So where to place the adolescent? So if I'm the charge nurse working on this floor, if it's an older adolescent, maybe your 17, 18, 19 year old, I probably would lean toward the adult floor because they may not be comfortable having, you know, listening to a lot of crying or a lot of carrying on, temper tantrums and what, you know, because kids can be pretty loud. So they may feel better being around other adults where it might be a little quieter. If it's a younger adolescent, more your 13, 14, 15, 16 year old, they might be more comfortable being around other kids. That might th make them feel a little more comfortable. So that's kind of how I would approach that. Uh, they might be more dependent on the caregiver than what they had been before because depending on where you're meeting them at, what stage of their illness they're in, they can become very frail, very weak, and have a lot of difficulty taking care of themselves. And remember, adolescents, they're trying to figure out who they are and how they fit in the world, and now they have this. So their concept of themselves is radically altered. Lack privacy. You know, you're, you're in a hospital. So you don't get privacy when you're in a hospital. Maladaptive coping behaviors, we want to keep an eye out for those because those can actually occur. Okay. Uh, refusing treatments again. Now remember, when you're talking about an older adolescent, somebody who, when they're 18, they're actually considered an adult, legally, they can refuse treatment. They can say they don't want it. And you can't force it on them. And their parents can't force it on them because legally they're an adult when they hit 18. Easily overwhelmed and may show regression. That may happen. Uh, worries about condition, self-esteem, identity, and family. Remember, 
your self-esteem as an adolescent is very fragile and it's very much based on outward appearances and what others think of you and your peer group and what your peer group thinks of you. So all of these thoughts are constantly circulating in their brains and it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult for them to kind of be okay with what's happening with them. So some of the things that we could do provide solitary time because remember they lack privacy so we could try to you know maybe say okay uh, you're gonna have this next couple of hours to be by yourself I'll make sure that nobody comes in your room I'll let the other staff know you know we should avoid going in your room you're gonna try to rest or you're gonna watch TV you're gonna watch a movie or whatever um, give realistic choices remember let them be involved let them make whatever choices they can Include them in medical related matters whenever possible. We want them to be part of it. Use peer support and interaction. If you can get some of their closest circle of friends to come and visit, if that's okay, if it's not contraindicated for some reason, and the peers are willing to come, they want to provide support, that might not be a bad idea in a structured environment where you know you can kind of monitor what's happening. Uh, may expand networks to include support groups and community programming. Again, having them maybe interact with others that are in the same spot that they're in might help them not feel so isolated and alone. Because remember, their peer group is not in the same situation that they're in. So they may not really understand what they're going through. They, they feel sympathetic towards them. They want to provide support for them. They care about their friend, but they're not in the same situation. So having them get a, t a link to support groups in their area, and they don't have to meet face to face. These things can happen online. There's lots of them online. So it's part of our role to find these uh, different support groups for them. Give them the option and see if that's something that they might be interested in. We don't want to force it on them, but we just want them to know that it is an option. Okay, so we don't want to forget the siblings. A lot of times, remember I said earlier, the siblings can become resentful because now the whole world, the whole world of this family is centered on this sick and dying child. So they may have issues with their self-esteem. They don't feel like they're worth anything now because everybody's, you know, they're all focused on this one and what am I? I'm nothing. Nobody cares about me anymore. They get less support from the parents. They may have mood swings. They don't really understand what's happening. They, they just know that this one has now become the center of attention. They may display a negative attitude toward that sick sibling. Feelings of jealousy, embarrassment, resentment, loneliness, isolation, all of these things. They could feel all of these things. You know, they're, they're resentful that this kiddo is getting all the attention, but they feel embarrassed because they're resentful that this kiddo is getting all the attention. They know that their sibling is sick, but because the kid is sick, they're getting all the attention, and that makes them feel jealous, and now they feel embarrassed. Things that they cause the condition maybe in some way, maybe they did something, you know, depending on where they're at on the development scale, they might feel like they're the reason why this kid has gotten sick. They did something bad and now their brother or their sister is sick. So some of the things that we can do, instruct the parents to maintain familiar home routines as much as possible. And remember, we want to provide that anticipatory guidance that this is how it could possibly potentially affect the siblings. We want to make sure that the siblings are kept involved so they don't feel like they're being ignored. Include the siblings in simple care. What can they do to help their sick sibling? Let's let them do it. Let's show them what they can do. There's things that they could do, no matter how old they are. There's things a toddler could do. I mean, they could take a, a cool cloth and put it on their, their sibling's forehead, or maybe, you know, have them help them with socks, putting socks on, or whatever. You know, little things that the kiddo could do to help them feel better. Okay, uh, provide information about the ill child. And again, we want to make it age appropriate. So we don't want to overwhelm them with a lot of technical jargon or information that they're not going to be able to understand. But what information we can provide, we should provide.
Okay, again, making them feel like they're included. Okay, now for the dying child, care shifts from curative technological approach. Now we're providing more care that enables them to move toward death. Assessing own inner resources for healing. Now we know that this is where we're headed. There's nothing else that we could possibly do. So hospice care, you know, comfort care, when we know there isn't anything more we can do, but we want them to have the best and function the best that we can for the time that they have remaining. So help the child restore mental, physical, and spiritual balance to attain, to attain peace at the time of death. Let's help them try to accept that this is where they're headed the best that we can. Be present. Always want to be present. Use touch. You know, that connection, that human connection. Give family choices whenever possible and assess the situation and determine the proper environment. Where should they be? Ultimately, we probably would like them to be able to be at home with their family, but depending on where they're at, that may not be possible. But if it is possible, we should try to help that happen. This slide's talking about nursing approach after the child has died. So saying goodbye should not be rushed. You know, when, when your client dies, no matter if it's a child or an adult, you don't want to rush the family through the goodbye process. You want to give them as much time as possible to be with their loved one as long as they need to be there. Call them by their name. You know, you don't want to refer to them in third person. I mean, you, you want to call them by their name. You, you don't want to dehumanize them. And some things that you could potentially say, you know, just say, I'm sorry, because I'm sure you're going to feel that way. This must be terribly hard for you. Is there anything I can do for you? Is there anybody I can call for you? You know, is there other family members that you would like to be here to help you, to support you? I'm here for you. Let me let me let me make some phone calls for you. Let me do that for you. Would you like me to stay with you for a while? You know, those are some options that things that you could say that would be perfectly appropriate and not be you know kind of well, I don't really want to be here. You want to make sure that they feel supported. Okay? No matter how you might feel about the process, you might not feel very comfortable about being in there, but you need to provide that support. That's important for you as your role as the caregiver. It doesn't end just because your client has died. You know, their family is still there and they're still part of your client. Okay, what about the nurse? Let's not forget the nurse. Again, the nurse is a human being. So what kind of care do we need? We might feel helpless. We, we weren't able to prevent this child from dying. Remember, we're nurturers. We want to heal. We want to make others better. That's what we do. But in some cases, when you're dealing with situations like this, that's not possible. All we can do is make their death the best we possibly can and, and help with the family. That's about all we can do. And that makes us feel very helpless. Burnout. They may feel mentally and physically exhausted. It's very stressful. Okay, compassion fatigue, that's a real thing. It's a real thing. There's lots of research out there about compassion fatigue. The helplessness, the confusion, the isolation that we feel as the caregiver. Moral distress, acting in a manner contrary to personal or professional values. You know, we have to do what the family wants and maybe that doesn't jive with what we want. Maybe we don't think that they should just be accepting this. Maybe we think that more should be done. And it affects us. It causes a moral distress. Pay attention to our personal needs. Don't forget, you know, a lot of times nurses forget about themselves. They're so concerned about others and taking care of others that we a lot of times get forgotten in our own scheme of things. We forget about ourselves. So we have to make sure that we're taking time for ourselves, especially when we're dealing with this type of client and in this type of situation. Okay, so that concludes this lecture recording. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.